Hi, I'm Alan Cecil, and with me today I have... Dan Petro. We are presenting You're Doing It Wrong. We're talking about vulnerabilities that exist in virtually every device out there in the IoT world that's a critical issue that we need to talk to you about because random numbers are used everywhere. Before we get too far, though, let's talk a little bit about random numbers and why they're so important to security. Uh, numbers, of course, are kind of how computers work. So a random number can be a stand-in for all sorts of things that we don't normally think of as numerical. So encryption keys, authentication tokens, and our uh, lovely friend business logic. Uh, one of the things you're going to notice uh, throughout this presentation is that um, the vulnerabilities that we're going to describe here have a lot to do with the specific logic of a particular application um, in a way that is hard to replicate on Mac. So um, a lot of the uh, vulnerabilities that we'll discuss here are kind of specific to particular applications or frameworks and aren't necessarily the kind of canned exploit um, that you might expect from like a widespread CVE. One of the problems though is that computers are notoriously bad at making truly random numbers. And that's because computers need to be deterministic. If you did math and every time you got a different value out of pi, uh, or you had a Pentium 2 processor that just kept messing up floating point numbers, you'd have problems, and we have seen this in the past. So we make computers to be very deterministic. However, sometimes you need stuff that isn't deterministic. You need some, some entropy, and that's where our hardware RNG comes in. That's its job, is to make entropy, to make a source of randomness, to uh, be a seed for some way of getting random numbers. So that solves the problem, right? Now's actually a good time to bring up that there's two major kinds of random number generators that you'll find. A pseudo-random number generator and a true random number generator. Uh, you might think, from the names of them, that you uh, want the true random number generator, or the TRNG. That that's the good one, and pseudo ones are the bad ones. But it's not that simple. Really, the distinction is only that one is made in software and one is made in hardware. Um, and the names uh, really lead you astray here. I particularly hate the name true random number generator for the hardware ones. It sort of implies a kind of quality behind them that isn't necessarily present. I suspect this naming comes from big RNG as a propaganda term. But in any case, the pseudo random number generators also come in two major forms. The uh, cryptographically secure random number generators, or SysPingerg for short, uh, and regular ones. So the regular ones are things you'll find in like libc random or the percent twister that are meant to be fast. They're uh, really efficient. They're just pieces of software. In both cases, they worth, uh, work basically the same though. You take an initial seed number uh, that could be uh, any length, somewhere between uh, 32 bits all the way up to like 128 bits. And then you stretch that entropy out indefinitely into the future. You could produce some uh, the stream of seemingly random numbers from that seed, right? So it's an entirely predictable set of numbers given that initial seed. Um, and so the distinction between a cryptographically secure random number generator and a not secure one is basically that the um, regular ones like the percent twister or libc random or any number of other um, common implementations will leak information about the internal state and therefore the seed as you go along. So there's really no secure way to use those. Um, there's, they're never safe to use for uh, security critical uh, pieces of information. Anytime you actually need uh, like secure information like a crypto key or something like that, um, you should definitely be using a, a CSP RNG. And then the uh, security of the hardware RNGs are something that we um, investigated in this research. One unfortunate part about the design of these hardware random number generators is that there's not a lot of information known about the details of how they actually work. Uh, they're basically black boxes. So if you wanted to find out about how your uh, favorite IoT device, the hardware random number generator, it actually works, they're, you know, you're kind of out of luck. Uh, one notable exception is the STM32. I want to give them a shout out from uh, STM. My, uh, uh, ST Microelectronics. They actually have really great information about the details of the inner workings of their RNG, as well as a proof of correctness, a kind of proof of uh, good quality random numbers that came out of it. Um, but there's two kind of basic uh, digital designs that you'll find uh, for um, how to produce uh, random numbers in hardware, at least in a low cost way that you'll find in IoT devices. Um, analog circuits and clock timings. Um, the first one is an analog circuit. So you're probably more familiar with digital circuits, that is circuits that are gated by a clocking function. Um, analog circuits are kind of the opposite. There's no central gate by a clock. Um, so what you can do is uh, you set up an analog circuit that sort of looks like the diagram we have here in the top right. And uh, there's a, a 
a bit that flows back and forth between this not function. So it's either a zero or a one, or then a zero and a one kind of back and forth again. And it sort of spins in this infinite loop going back and forth between zero and one at a function, at a, a rate rather, that um, is not exactly random, but sort of arbitrary. So if you were to poll that, if you say, uh, ask the analog circuit at any given point in time to you know, find out what the, the bit is, the value will be pretty random. Um, and that's a pretty good way of designing a hardware random number generator. There's also a method where you're using multiple clocks at the same time to get a difference between the two, a delta between the measured differences between those clocks. If you had two clocks that were derived from the same source, the result should, in theory, be identical. So you would always get a one or a zero, uh, depending on when you sampled it. But if you allow them to run freely and measure the delta between the two, you can get a pretty normal distribution of differences between the two. Uh, sometimes this happens on, uh, on situations un that you wouldn't expect, where the designers didn't deliberately do that. One of them happens to be the original Super Nintendo. They had a 21 megahertz clock for the central processing unit and a 24.576 clock for the APU, the audio processing unit. The result is that speedrunners playing Super Metroid have to deal with random timings due to moving data across the bus when going through door transitions. Sometimes these random situations happen on unrelated devices. And in a hardware random number generator, you're taking advantage of what just sometimes happens accidentally and using that deliberately to get random numbers out of it. There are some issues that come up if you're calling too often, if you're just running too fast and you're, you're calling too frequently, for instance, that output uh, call from that analog circuit method, if you're calling it too often, you're going to get the same number twice in a row because you didn't give it enough time to transition. And the same thing could happen with uh, the clock method, if you're calling it too frequently. You could also end up with accidental syncing. It could just be that both of your clocks happen to align, so they're both operating at exactly the same offset. There's no guarantee that you're going to be perfect, but it's usually good enough that it's, it's fine as long as you're not uh, calling it constantly. How IoT does RNG is interesting. Most new IoT system on a chips have a hardware RNG device built into them as of 2021. That hardware RNG is an entire peripheral devoted to just RNG. So it must be secure, right? So the thing about uh, IoT and programming on IoT devices is that there's not really any operating systems to kind of smooth over the errors that you might make. Uh, typically, you just run C and C++ on bare metal. So if you needed a random number for a, a security critical uh, piece of information like a crypto key, you just call the hardware RNG peripheral directly, usually through a HAL function, a hardware abstraction layer function, um, and something that looks basically like this. Um, this, of course, is pseudocode, but it looks basically the same across well, basically every SDK and operating system. So there's the HAL get random uh, number function, and there's kind of two parts that we really care about here. Um, for one, there's an uh, output variable, the out number. That's the actual random number that we care about. Um, if you're familiar with C, it's an output variable. Basically, you um, send it a pointer to the number, and then the function will overwrite the value um, at that pointer. And then the actual return code, which has an error message, the error message that'll tell you in case something went wrong along the way. Um, there's lots of things that can go wrong when you are talking to a piece of hardware, right? The peripheral might be broken or something went wrong over the bus. Uh, maybe the our, uh, random number generator peripheral just wasn't ready yet. The, maybe the relative positions of Jupiter and Saturn, for all we know, are just not aligned. Uh, in any case, uh, an error can occur in the calling of this random number generator function, and it'll let you know about that in the return code. So we want to ask the natural question, how many people out there in the wild actually check this error code? So as it happens, almost nobody actually checks the return codes of these HAL RNG functions. Basically, everybody out there just sort of makes a call to the random number generator peripheral and just uses whatever result it happens to give you. Uh, you can see two results here from uh, FreeRTOS, which is a popular IoT operating system, um, and the MediaTek uh, 7697. Um, you can see both of these calls here are basically what we looked at earlier. There's a return code that you're not seeing that is checked, and then the uh, output variable that's um, put into it. So maybe you're uh, wondering, all right, so you you know didn't check the return code of the HAL RNG function. You know, what's the worst that could happen? Undefined behavior. We don't know what will happen, and that is a pen tester's 
favorite phrase. The worst that can happen might sound like it's the number zero. And in fact, we have seen examples of this. The XKCD joke that you always have to reference when you're talking about random numbers is that you ask for a random number and it always returns a static value, a constant. That isn't quite what usually happens, but it's not far off. We've seen large swaths of zeros in a one gigabyte file of supposedly random numbers. And even in our own implementations, when we were trying to do it properly, we ended up with results that had large quantities of zeros in them. But that's not the most insidious one. The worst is where you have partial entropy. It looks like it's random, but it isn't as random as you thought it was. A good example is you make a call. You get a 32-bit unsigned integer back. It has four bytes of random numbers, and the first call looks fine. You call again. It still looks OK. Then you call a third time and you get zeros, and you call a fourth time and you still get zeros. But if you're not looking carefully enough, you might not notice that you got a whole bunch of zeros in your calls. This partial entropy can be really tricky because it substantially reduces the actual randomness that you're working for, the strength of the random number that you're getting. And it might seem like this is not an issue, but this seems to happen pretty often. So this is actually how this entire research project got started. Uh, we do a lot of uh, IoT engagements at Bishop Fox under what we usually call a product security review. We like to say that if it breaks when you drop it, it's a product security review. Um, and so one time we had a client that was uh, developing an IoT device that does a, a lot of cryptography in it that was kind of like a security device. And uh, uh, I was reviewing the code and looked at the uh, code which used a lot of a uh, random number generation in the process of doing a lot of this uh, cryptography. And I uh, was curious about you know, how it did random number generation on uh, such a tiny low power device. Um, and it turns out that there was a, a hardware random number generator on the uh, SOC that uh, our client was using. And uh, on a lark, I sort of asked uh, to see like, hey, what, uh, what is the quality of the random numbers coming out of this thing? I you know, was sort of curious, I hadn't actually um, seen the output of uh, one of these hardware random number generators previously. And I uh, didn't really expect it to be bad. I was thinking that like, you know, the hardware random number generator surely is the gold standard for uh, RNG, right? And so when we uh, got the results back, I, you know, we ran it through some uh, statistical randomness tests and it failed basically all of them. Um, and then upon further inspection, looking at the actual um, like binary files, like a couple of gigabytes of uh, output from the RNG, like large swaths of it were just zero. Uh, surely I thought that this was like a mistake, that this, this, this can't have been right. So we um, then embarked on this uh, uh, sort of longer journey to investigate to see, was it just a single buggy chip or was it some crazy buggy code? And this entire thing kind of blew up from there. So you might think that encryption keys of zero are about as bad as you can get, right? I mean, surely it can't get worse than that. Well, I'd like to introduce you to Petro's Law. If I could have one eponymous law, one law named after myself, Help me out here, DEF CON, it would be this. It can always be worse. No matter how bad you think it is, it can always be worse. So what could be worse than encryption keys of zero? Uninitialized memory, that's what. So take these uh, three lines of pseudocode, for example. Um, these are pseudocode, of course, but if you just hop onto GitHub and look around, you'll find lots of examples of this in the real world. So you uh, declare, but not instantiate, a number that you're going to be using as uh, your holder for a random number. This is declared on the stack. Uh, you then pass this to the hal random number uh, function. However, if the hal function works in such a way that it uh, doesn't perturb uh, the uh, random number uh, variable uh, when there's an error condition, like it doesn't set it to zero, say, then what'll happen is when you go to use it later on, the value will just be whatever happened to be present in RAM prior to the call. So this can actually happen quite regularly um, in the real world too. For instance, if you're doing some cryptography with like a Diffie-Hellman key exchange, this will involve generating a random number and then sending it over the network to a potential adversary. So this is something that's quite realistic in practice. So let's talk about some real world instances. In 2019, a study against over 75 million publicly available certificates found that over 435,000 of them were vulnerable to attack. In the study, they specifically called out lightweight IoT devices are particularly prone to being in low entropy states. And I'm not saying that our research here directly points to what they found, but it's a pretty clear link that when you have this many devices that are producing such low entropy results, 
it seems pretty likely that this was what they found. So you might have thought this was going to be a very simple case of just simply blame the users, right? There was pesky users aren't uh, checking the return codes, and we just need to uh, make sure that they're calling the uh, functions correctly. Well, it's actually not quite so simple. Uh, so take the, this for instance. This is uh, some pseudocode at the top here. The, uh, this is from the uh, MediaTek uh, 7697's uh, uh, documentation. You call the random number, you check if the uh, status code is not equal to OK, and then it, you sort of handle the error. Well, the handling of the error comment right there is doing a lot of heavy lifting because when you need a random number for some uh, security critical code, you can't just simply move forward without that random number. It's sort of important to the core thing that you're trying to accomplish there. So generally speaking, you're kind of given two options. One is to spin loop. So you can just kind of while loop, call the random number generator function again, over and over and over again until you get an okay status. Basically, you're going to use 100% CPU indefinitely, maybe forever, if the RNG peripheral is broken, waiting for a result. That's not very good. Uh, but the second option is just to quit out entirely, kill the entire process, or like if you're in the networking stack, if you're uh, trying to make a TLS key for a, a TCP connection that you're in, then it's going to involve killing the entire TCP connection. Like, that's not a very good option either. Both are so unacceptable that it really leaves developers with only option three, which is YOLO. You can't just spin loop because it'll lead to broken, buggy, useless devices. Same thing with quitting and killing the entire process and starting over. This is going to make a device no one would want to buy. So we force users into this win unwinnable situation. RNG and IoT is fundamentally broken, and it's not the fault of the user. So let's talk about the right way to RNG. And the right way to do this is to use a cryptographically secure pseudo-random number generator. It's a mouthful, but a CSP RNG has some distinct advantages. It never blocks execution. It has APIs calls that don't fail. It pulls from multiple entropy sources. More on that in a second. It always returns crypto quality results due to stretching out the amount of randomness that you have. In short, it's a much stronger system than just relying on a single source of entropy. So the way that the uh, CSP RNG subsystem works is you start with a number of entropy sources. So these can include the hardware random number generator, but also lots of other things that an operating system might have access to, such as interrupt timing from uh, various devices, um, networking um, uh, receive times, the like tiny nanosecond uh, receive times um, has a quite a bit of entropy them to the network. Um, and you XOR them all together into this big entropy pool. So what's important to know about this is all of them are XORed together um, so that uh, it's not sufficient to break just a single one of these uh, entropy sources in order to predict the uh, output of the random number generator. An attacker would need to simultaneously predict all of them. So that's very strong. Additionally, what you can do is then read from the entropy pool by a cryptographically secure random number generator. Um, these are typically uh, just uh, like a hashing function, like a Linux kernel will just MD5 the uh, entropy pool. And then in order to produce uh, more numbers afterward, MD5 the uh, last output with the entropy pool itself. So you can kind of chain basically key stretching your way out to produce a, a functionally infinite amount of entropy um, from a, a static amount. Uh, also, because we can study these uh, uh, hashing functions like offline, we're very sure about the uh, uh, strength of the results. So this also makes remediation tricky here. You see, it's not a simple case of, you know, you zigged where you should have zagged, where there's a, a bug in a piece of software somewhere, and whoever made the software can just kind of fix that bug, we patch it, and move on with our lives. Um, this is a case of a missing feature, and one across a very heterogeneous uh, landscape of devices and pieces of software. Um, the most likely place that you'd implement a feature like this, a, a CSP RNG subsystem, is one of the emerging uh, the IoT operating systems, something like FreeRTOS, Contiki NG, RideOS, or one of many others. Um, and we'd highly recommend using one of those if you're making a new uh, IoT device from scratch, um, because the individual device SDKs seeming like the, they're unlikely to get this kind of a feature. Um, those SDKs are usually very thin, filled with example code that's mostly around hardware enablement and not so much around uh, making a full device end-to-end. -end. Um, so yeah, this is gonna be a, a tricky uh, a remediation process. Now this vulnerability might be with us for some time. This is how RNG on IoT devices should work too. 
but right now it doesn't. And the rest of this talk is all about convincing you why you really do need a CSP RNG subsystem. It's absolutely critical to have this. Now, let's talk a little bit more about using hardware RNG to seed an insecure PRNG, because this will matter a lot when we start moving into the rest of this talk. Nobody codes from scratch. We were talking earlier about blaming the users for doing it wrong. Well, if you're a user and you're grabbing reference or example code, and that reference library or that code that you're working with has vulnerabilities, it propagates those vulnerabilities out. And one of the places this shows up is some IoT devices and operating systems use the hardware, but only to seed an insecure libc pseudorandom number, number, number generator. What that looks like is you're getting a nice, potentially random number from the hardware random number generator. You're using that to seed libc, but everything after that is not necessarily cryptographically secure. You're not really using the hardware, even though you might think you are. This shows up in the MediaTek Linkit 7697, and specifically in the Contiki NG. I'm going to let Dan describe this in a demo we have for you. So for this demo, we built an IoT security camera device. It takes pictures every few minutes, just like a real security camera, and posts them to a publicly accessible website. So the only thing keeping an attacker from being able to view your photos is that each file is named with this long random file name here, chosen by the camera. Uh, now, before you go thinking that this is unrealistically vulnerable, uh, this is how Discord works and lots of other applications like it. Anytime you take a photo and send it to a friend over Discord, it's publicly accessible. Uh, the long random file name is the only thing that's keeping people from seeing your photos. Uh, our device, however, is built using Contiki NG, a popular IoT operating system. Uh, when you call the operating system to get a random number, it will use the hardware RNG on board, but only to seed the insecure libc rand function. So we don't know what the seed is, but we don't have to because we can derive it. So suppose one day you take a photo with your camera and post it on social media. Wow, what a cool camera you bought. How fun. But what you didn't know is that an attacker can use this file name to derive what the original seed was that generated it. That's because that's how the libc ran function works. Our attacker here uses untwister to find the seed. Once they have, they can use that seed to determine every past and future value from the RNG. So our attacker can just plug in some of those numbers back into the camera website and view every photo that the camera has ever taken, even if they've never been shared before. All right, so let's have a word about exploitability. This comes up a lot anytime you give a talk about random number generation or crypto stuff is how exploitable is this really? And the answer here is very exploitable, but it's not going to be a canned exploit. You're not going to see a, you know, you're doing it wrong dot pi that just sort of exploits things in the wild. Um, it's gonna have to do with the uh, particular business logic of the device that you're speaking to. Um, it's going to be very particular to individual um, Internet of Things devices. So there's not going to be just like a simple CV that you can kind of apply um, universally across the board to you know, every device. Um, that comes with uh, one asterisk, one possible exception here, and that's with uh, asymmetric keys. You see, one of the things that often causes the um, hardware um, RNG functions to fail is calling them very rapidly in succession. So you call them too quickly, and then it runs out of entropy and just starts giving you zeros. Um, so one really common way to make that happen in the real world is to make a 2048 or 4096 bit RSA key, right? In order to get that many bits from the hardware RNG, you're going to need to kind of call it in a loop in succession very quickly. And those sorts of keys are very sensitive to low entropy. It's not like an AES key where if, you know, you're missing 32 bits off of a 128 bit key, you're still, you know, probably fine. Whereas uh, with RSA keys, that's not the case. In fact, there's a different talk at this DEF CON going on right now called The Mechanics of Compromising Low Entropy RSA Keys. We did not plan for this. That was just a thing that sort of happened. So this is actually a thing that you can check for empirically. Um, you can look at the RSA, RSA keys coming out of IoT devices and uh, see if they are of poor quality or not. And that's the sort of thing you can um, do uh, from the outside black box as well. So if you're a pen tester and you have an IoT engagement coming up, uh, how you're going to actually exploit this is going to depend greatly on whether it's a black box approach or whether you have the source code to the application of the device itself. Um, as a black box approach, it's going to be much trickier. 
Um, you're going to want to look at the output of the RNG from however the application is using it. Um, the easiest way, as we mentioned, is using the asymmetric keys. Um, if a, the device produces an RSA key or a certificate of some form, then you can look at those uh, cryptographically to see if uh, any known attacks work against it. That's probably going to be your best bet. Um, second, though, um, look for any opportunities to tax the RNG. So any opportunity for the attacker to influence how often the RNG is being called. So for instance, if the uh, device is producing some ID value and that is uh, done at the request of a user, then try you know, requesting that very, very quickly and see if the numbers start uh, becoming zero or um, if they're lower entropy. Other than that, um, trying to actually measure the entropy of uh, values that come out of an application can be very hard because very often it's going to be um, permuted in some way. You're not going to get the raw hex values that come out of um, the RNG. Typically, it's going to be produced as like a, a six-digit pin or something like that. And in order to perform statistical analysis on uh, the kinds of uh, output of the RNG, you're going to need a, you know, a very large sample size, like a gigabyte or so. And uh, in order to get a gigabyte of you know, six digit pins, you're gonna have to make a lot of calls. Uh, so that might actually be very difficult in practice. Uh, with source code, however, things become a lot more visible. Um, you can look into to see how the hardware RNG is called and uh, see if the return code is being ignored. Um, I hesitate to recommend actually implementing a CSP RNG subsystem on your own um, at this state. Uh, since there's a lot that can go wrong there, there's a lot of moving pieces um, that go on there. There's certainly uh, a lot that you can mess up, um, but at least consider it if it's um, critical enough. Okay, you've done everything right. You're spin looping, you're blocking until the hardware random number generator gives you valid non-zero results or validated that you've used every library correctly and that your libraries aren't written in a bad way that are perhaps just seeding libc. You validated all of the code you're using. Surely you've got it right now, right? Nope, there's still some usage quirks. You're still likely going to do it wrong. In fact, you will do it wrong. This is the same level of difficulty as trying to write crypto code. And for the most part, we know not to try to write our own crypto code. It's, it's kind of a, a well-known law. Well, this is my law. My law is don't write your own RNG code. <laughs> you will do it wrong. Now, you might potentially have some documentation, maybe, if you can find it, on some usage quirks you're run gonna run into. For instance, the LPC 54628 has a warning on page 1106 out of 1152 that says when you're calling it, you have to throw out 32 results, use one, and then throw out the next 32 results and repeat the process. It is the only way to guarantee that you're getting proper random numbers out of it. But how would you know if you didn't sort through a thousand page document? And if you saw this code written down and you went through the comments, unless they specifically called out why they were doing it, you would think that this was buggy code. This doesn't seem sane. You can't try writing RNG code on your own. It's as bad as trying to write crypto code and even worse, it, this is absolutely a situation that emphasizes you can't blame the user for this. There's no one that's gonna get this right. One of the things we've touched on in this talk are hardware dev kits that SOC, Silicon on a Chip vendors, release to allow developers to debug and flash their devices. An IoT developer is going to build their advice around an SOC and they'll be writing their code in C or C++ or something similar on a PC and then flashing their device and testing it. The dev kits provide a variety of different features for testing things, and each vendor does it a completely different way. For instance, this is a SparkFun board that is using an NRF-based SOC, and it has a USB port for debugging and flashing, as well as an SD card. Each vendor implements it completely differently, and for instance, this is an older version of an STM32, this particular design has a debugger at the top that can flash the device. The actual device you'd be flashing is this SOC down here. This portion of the board is still a dev kit. It has all of the functionality in that chip exposed on the pens on the sides. But you can do some interesting things. You could flash uh, this, this chip and debug it with this portion. And when you're satisfied with the device, you can actually snap off this entire upper portion. Uh, sometimes you'll do this because you'll develop your device and then use the dev kit itself. One of these designs that we did on the side on my TaskBot project was with this Cypress PSOC5 based board. 
To flash this device, you plug this end into a computer. And to actually use it, you're using a completely separate USB port on the other side. In our case, we connected the actual dev kit to a board we manufactured. This was made by Total in the TaskSpot community. Uh, this allows us to connect to a video game console and pretend to be a controller, as in, for instance. You can also just make your own hardware that doesn't have any of this extra debugging functionality at all. And that's what we did with this TASTM32 board made by Onosaurus. Same concept. This allows us to connect directly to a video game console and pretend to be a controller. We just have cables that go from Ethernet to, say, a Nintendo or Super Nintendo. But in this case, we've taken the SOC right here and incorporated it into a board of our own design. And that's generally what a IoT device developer is going to do. Now, there are a variety of different advantages of doing that. One of the boards we worked with was this newer version of an STM32 that incorporated everything over uh, just a single USB port. Rather than splitting it out like the PSOC5 did, this has a USB serial interface. It has debugging functionality. Uh, there's various different ways that you can talk just over USB. This was really interesting to work with. Uh, and ultimately, the bulk of our research time was working with devices like this to try to access the hardware RNG that was on the SOC. This particular device had really good documentation. So a lot of credit to ST Micro for that. They even went so far as to provide a proof of their randomness. And when we started trying to reproduce the results, uh, we actually ran into several problems. One of the issues we ran into was that even with a reference library and code and documentation, we still ran into problems with not properly spin locking and blocking execution of the program. For instance, in our early tests, we were using something called Byte Circle, just an analysis tool that allowed us to throw the data at this, uh, this program, and it would show the byte distribution in a nice circle. So out of 255 possible different combinations, what we found is that all of the values we were getting were very low numbers for some reason. When you looked at the data in a file, it looked like it was properly random. But what we found was that we were actually calling it too frequently. Uh, we weren't blocking properly. And as a result, we were calling the hardware RNG too frequently and, and starving it, getting bad results as uh, out of it as a result. One of the other challenges we ran into was some of the devices made it very difficult to even get the data off of. MediaTek could be flashed over USB, but to actually exfiltrate the data, we had to use this crazy method over wireless and do various Git calls. It was pretty complica complicated. And really, the bulk of our research was just spending time trying to get accurate numbers out of these devices. I bring up all this complexity because I want to highlight Duango AC's role, as it were. Don't try to make your own hardware RNG code. It's as bad as writing crypto code. I've said it before, but I can't emphasize this point enough. We spent a long time trying to do this and still managed to mess it up several times in the process. IoT vendors really have it rough, because if they do release a device that is standalone like this, how do you flash it in the field? Once you've released this, you've broken off the debugger. There's possibly no debugger on it at all. There's a lot of hardware out there that possibly has badly implemented hardware RNG that vendors simply can't fix. So to pen testers, this is going to be a perennial finding that will pop up for years to come, because there's already hardware out there that's potentially using insecure RNG methods, and it's not easy to fix. OK, so let's take a look at what the quality of the entropy looks like coming out of these hardware random number generators is raw. No more bugs, no more silly usage quirks and library shenanigans. Let's look at the actual numbers coming from the hardware RNGs themselves. Are they good? Or are they bad? So we per, uh, ran a bunch of the uh, RNGs through some statistical analysis, and we've got some cool results to show you. Uh, what you're looking at here is uh, a histogram for the uh, MediaTek 7697. That is a, a diagram of all bytes and how often they occur, 0 to 255 from uh, left to right. So what we should see is basically a flat graph. Every, every byte should occur just as often as every other byte, maybe with a little bit of fuzziness at the top. But that's not what we see. What we see is this obvious sawtooth sort of pattern that occurs down the line. And if there's two things that don't go along well together, it's uh, obvious repeating patterns and crypto keys. Do you feel comfortable using this for your encryption key? Like, I for sure don't. Uh, next up is the uh, Nordic NRF 528040. 
uh, for this, uh, there's this obvious repeating 12 byte pattern of just zeros. There's a zero, zero, zero. Um, it's a little bit hard to see in the picture there. The highlighting doesn't capture the third zero. Um, but this happens every in hex 50 bytes. Um, and uh, that's super bad. Obviously, repeating patterns of any kind is bad, but especially fully zeroed uh, bytes um, coming from the Nordic board uh, was something that we saw that kind of stood out and made it fail all of the uh, statistical randomness tests um, there forward. Uh, this example was so egregious and so peculiar that we thought for sure for a really long time that it was just our instrumentation that was at fault. But we don't think it is for three reasons. Uh, one, we uh, spent a really long time uh, investigating our code, trying to figure out how this could possibly be happening from it and never figured out how. Uh, but two, it's a 12-bit pattern, which is uh, very weird. If it was exactly one byte, like a null byte, then you know perhaps you'd think that it's just a a null terminated string was kind of getting copied around incorrectly somewhere, but uh, exactly 12 bits is really curious. Um, and also the, um, the amount that it jumps by uh, 50 bytes, uh, sometimes it'll actually jump by a little bit more than 50 bytes, which kind of offsets things a little bit. So there'll be like maybe 80 bytes or something like that in hex. Um, and then it'll kind of uh, continue on the pattern from there, uh, which also uh, wouldn't really make sense uh, as an inconsistency in um, our, in our instrumentation. So aside from just a distribution of values, aside from just taking all of the bytes and putting them on a graph and seeing how frequent they are, you can do a lot more statistical analysis. There's a lot of tools out there, including Die Harder, that you can use on large data sets to see if there are repeating patterns. And we relied on this a lot when we were doing our OMEN implementation on the STM32. When we first started, we were failing all of the tests, and it took us a while to get the code right. We thought we were spin looping properly. We weren't. It turns out it's very difficult to do this properly, even when you think you know what you're doing. Once we got through all of the other tests, we still had one of the Die Harder tests that continued to fail, which was the RGB minimum distance test. So the minimum distance test, what it's doing is it takes a bunch of random numbers, interprets them as integers, and plots them in n-dimensional space, and then calculates, using a simple algorithm, uh, what the minimum distance between any two of those points are. And it should fall within expected parameters. Uh, what this is doing, really, is it's checking for repeats uh, or nearly repeated values, since um, any uh, repeats would cause the, uh, the minimum distance to become uh, smaller than it like normally should be. So what you're seeing here in terms of a failure is a p-value of exactly zero, which means that it's very confident that this uh, should not have occurred uh, randomly, or the chances of it uh, having occurred naturally is very small. At the same time you're watching this, we'll be releasing our code that gathered and analyzed the hardware RNG entropy itself. It's nothing terribly special, but took a long time to get right and working across a bunch of IoT dev boards. And while we don't think that there's any errors that would have impacted the results, uh, consider that even if it turns out that there's a bug in our code, what does it say that two computer security experts spent months studying and analyzing RNGs and still couldn't get them to work properly? And what does that say about the state of IoT security more broadly? OK, so what are the conclusions we've come to after talking through all of this? The first is that this affects the entire IoT industry. It's not a single vendor. It's not a single device. It's not a single particular quirk. This is widespread. And if you take nothing else out of this talk, the point we really want to make is that the IoT world needs a CSP RNG subsystem. This can't be fixed by just changing documentation and blaming users. You really need RNG code that is well vetted. Uh, and you should consider it dangerous to write it on your own. It's just like crypto code. And also, you should never use entropy directly from the hardware. You don't know how strong or weak it might be, as we just showed you. OK, so what can you actually do about this? Well, it depends on what camp you're in. If you're a device owner, keep an eye out for updates. IoT devices aren't the best in general with software updates. Uh, and you're going to want to make sure that yours is uh, ready to take them when they're available. Um, IoT device developers, uh, we'd highly recommend using one of the emerging IoT operating systems. We don't have a strong preference for one versus the other at this point, but uh, if you're making a new device from scratch or maybe even just updating a current one, we'd highly recommend using those rather than writing raw C on the bare metal yourself. Um, if you're an IoT device manufacturer or an OS developer themselves, uh, implement one of these uh, CSPRNG subsystems. Um, that's the only secure way to do it. There isn't a way to get around it. Um, you might even consider deprecating or straight up disallowing users from using the hardware RNG raw itself. And if you're a pen tester, 
keep an eye out for this because it's going to be a perennial finding for years to come. I am Alan Cecil, Duango AC. I'm Dan Petro, and uh, thanks a lot.